Welcome. Thank you for joining us and uh, to the Greensboro History Museum's March webinar series, New in Town, Immigration and Refugees in Guilford County. My name is Katherine Johns. I am the tour coordinator and resource specialist for the education department at the Greensboro History Museum. During the March webinar, we are joined by members of UNC Greensboro's Center for New North Carolinians, which we will often hibernate to CNNC. Today's conversation is made possible in part by the Greensboro History Museum's Inc., the City of Greensboro, and the Libraries Department. Any views, findings, or recommendations expressed in today's program do not necessarily reflect those aforementioned entities. We are also extremely pleased to have our guest audience join us. If you'll take the time to view at the bottom, uh, there are a Q&A icon. And by selecting this icon, you can type in questions for our panelists today. Um, Betsy has very generously offered that um, anytime that you feel like you have a question, pop it into the chat and I will, uh, at discretion, put some of those questions up for Ms. Jensen to answer. Um, by selecting this option, you can enter uh, the questions and then once you've typed in the question, just hit enter and then I can see it. Um, we have reserved the, uh, most of the conversation for questions today, but we will probably save about the last 10 minutes just specifically for questions. This evening, we welcome our panelists for today's webinar, which will also be featured as an archive in History Notes, the podcast section on the Greensboro History Museum website at a later date. For your convenience, please visit www.greensborohistory.org and select the tab Discover and Learn to hear the podcast when it's available. We will also be premiering this webinar tomorrow on the Greensboro History Museum's YouTube page at 5.30 p.m. So if there is somebody in your life that you want to see this or you want to rewatch it yourself, please go to our YouTube page and subscribe if you get the chance. We always need more subscribers. Today's presenter is Betsy Jensen, the Immigration Services Director at the Center for New North Carolinians at UNCG. She is a DOJ partially accredited representative providing legal assistance to low income immigrants and refugees in the triad area. We are so happy to have you today, Ms. Jensen. Thank you. Um, so, hi, I just wanna give a little disclaimer to start. I have a little bit of a cold. So if you see me stopping to, to drink tea, that is why. Um, but so, Today, what I'm going to cover is a very, very big topic, and we have a very little time, so I am going to be moving really quickly, hopefully, um, through all of this information. Um, as Catherine said, if you have questions, pop them in the chat, and we can address them as they come up. Um, but my goal today really is just to give you a skyline view of the immigration process, and we're talking about like, you know, from 30,000 feet. Um, because we don't have time for anything more. And then we're gonna talk specifically about some immigration issues that impact refugees in particular and about challenges for those without status. And that'll include DACA recipients and TPS, um, so um, temporary protected status and um, things like that. Um, but this is, my goal really is to give an idea. I think we hear a lot about immigration, particularly in recent years in the news, but I think the average American doesn't really know a lot about our immigration system. And so the goal here is to give you an overview, a very, very quick overview of our immigration system and um, so that you can have a better understanding when you're hearing the news. Um, so um, just a basic overview is um, there are immigration categories. So there are in, in you know, there are citizens. And so citizens are either people who are born in the United States um, or they're born to citizens, to citizens of the United States or they naturalize. So to naturalize is um, to take a citizenship test and, um, and become a US citizen. Um, and the naturalization test involves uh, an English test and a civics test and they look at good character and, and all of that. Um, then there are non-citizens and within non-citizens, there are immigrants. Um, so those are people intending to live in the United States. Among Im immigrants, there are lawful permanent residents. Those are people who were granted a visa to come live in the United States and granted a green card. 
um, to do so. And usually I'll, I'll go into more detail uh, into who those are in a minute. And then there's the next category are refugees and asylees um, who come here um, fleeing persecution um, and, and through a humanitarian process ultimately get a pathway to lawful permanent residency and then citizenship. And then there are also other lawful statuses which include mostly victims of crime and domestic violence um, or uh, children who have been abandoned um, those are sort of special categories that are much, much smaller category of, of, of um, immigrants. And then among the non-immigrants, non we have um, visitors, students, temporary workers, and then sort of, um, and then temporary protected status. Those are people who came here on a visitor's visa or something like that. And while they were here, there was some sort of disaster or something in their home. And we'll get into a little bit more detail with that in a bit. And then there's the undocumented. And among the undocumented are the people who have absolutely no pathway currently to citizenship and DACA um, recipients. So the um, Deferred Act, uh, Act for um, Childhood Arrivals is, um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, sorry, is um, our DACA. And you, you've probably heard a lot about them in the news and we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, in a bit. Um, so the path to citizenship is first you need to be a lawful permanent resident, which means we all hear the word green card holder. Somebody who holds a green card is a lawful permanent resident. Um, and to qualify to naturalize, not only do you have to have a green card um, and you have to have had that green card for, if you got the green card through marriage, you have to have had it for three years. Anybody else has to have had the green card for five years. Um, have, has to have had lawful permanent resident status for five years. Um, and you have to be 18 years of age. Um, you need to have been physically present in the US no less than half of the year for the past five years. Um, if you're gone longer than half of the year, you're considered to have abandoned your status. So um, you can't have done that. Um, you need to pay the application fee, which is currently $725. It was there were plans to increase it past, this past fall, but that was stopped by some, um, some federal judges. Um, you need to pass a civics exam and an English test. So you need to be able to speak, read, and write English. And then you need to um, pass a test in which they'll give you 100 questions about civics to study, which they've shown that most um, Americans wouldn't actually pass the civics test if they didn't study for it. Um, and you're asked 10 questions and you have to get six of them right. You have to be of good moral character. That means that you um, have to have paid your taxes, you have to pay your child support, you um, can't have um, like criminal, your criminal background, it has you know, no serious criminal issues, um, uh, no, um, no felonies, and really um, in terms of any drug related anything except the most um, minor marijuana possession would dis disqualify you. Um, and then lastly, you have to swear an oath of allegiance to the United States, which involves swearing that if, if, if required, you would, um, you would uh, take up arms and fight for the United States, which is a very fun question to ask an 80 year old Montagnard lady um, if she would take up arms and fight for the United States. Usually you get a giggle when you ask that question. <laughs> um, so, um, so how do you become a lawful permanent resident? There are in the United States, um, a handful of pathways to legal status in the United States. The, by far the largest category, um, and the biggest way that, um, people become, um, immigrants to the United States is through family immigration. Um, and, uh, so through family immigration, um, U.S. citizen adults can sponsor their spouse, their parent, a child, or a sibling. Um, however, um, the amount of time um, each of these sorts of petitions take vary widely. Um, and a, a lawful permanent resident, so if you're not yet a citizen, you can sponsor your spouse or your unmarried children under 21. Um, that is a pretty, that's a quicker process because those are immediate family members. But in the case of the US citizen adults who is petitioning for either say their adult child um, who's married or a sibling that um, you get preference categories. And like, so for a US adult uh, 
from the Philippines um, petitioning for their sibling, it could take as long as 20 years for that, for that mm. family member to get their visa to come to the United States. Um, and uh, so I'm not gonna go too much into this, but there are four countries that that backlog is, is much larger than for others. Um, those four countries, and it, it's based on the volume of people coming from those countries. So the, those four countries are Mexico, India, China, and the Philippines. And it's just because we have a really high volume of immigrants from those countries. Um, so the quotas are met for those countries more quickly than others. And um, mm. so there's a huge backlog for particular categories of um, immigration. And there's a lot of detail that I'm not getting into in there, um, but, but that's a very quick and dirty overview of family immigration. Um, employment immigration, I am not as familiar with. I have not done anything in family or in employment immigration, but essentially employment immigration is about filling positions where there are shortages um, like nurses and computer engineers, basically highly skilled workers or workers with advanced degrees. Um, and one issue I would say um, in the United States is that we actually have quite a few jobs um, that are low skill jobs that, that um, need employees. And we don't currently have a very good immigration <laughs> policy to fill those jobs. So those jobs include agriculture work, um, which I think we heard a lot about um, over the past year because there was a shortage because of COVID. Um, and then also in chicken, pro like uh, um, meat processing plants, they rely heavily on, on refugees as, or not on, they do re rely on refugees, but they rely a lot on immigrants and refugees. Um, and so those industries could really actually use um, a higher, like more um, access to, to more immigrants. Um, so the other, um, another area, and this is sort of a special one, is the diversity, the diversity lottery visa. Um, and this is only eligible, or only um, people from countries where the US receives a lower rate of immigrants. Um, it's only eligible to them. And every year, 50,000 people win the diversity lottery. Um, and then through that, so that's, out of all the people who apply, it's about a 0.8% chance um, per year of winning, um, which is, I guess, better than the typical, the regular lottery. Um, but uh, the applicants must have a high school diploma and you, ha or have a specific ability or trade. Um, if you win the diversity visa and say you're married with children, then your family would be able to, to join you as well. Um, of those 50,000, not as, not, not all 50,000 make it. Um, there are a lot of hoops they have to jump through once they've won the lottery and not everybody actually um, does that. Um, the next category are refugees and asylees and that's a humanitarian area. Um, the US accepts refugees and asylees who are fleeing persecution based on race, ethnicity, nationality, religion, gender, political opinion or membership in the social group. The US is actually historically um, the leader in the world in terms of accepting refugees um, and uh, just just until recent years. Um, and, uh, and so refugees are a special category that I'll go into a little bit more. And then, as I mentioned before, there's these other special categories that are typically victims of crime or abuse in the US. So there's U visas, T visas. So um, U visas are victims of a crime and they are assisting the police in solving that crime. Um, T visas are people who were trafficked, either um, okay. sex trafficking or labor trafficking. So they're victims of trafficking and this is to provide them a pathway to, to legal status. VAWA is, um, stands for Victim um, uh, Violence Against Women's, Women Act, but this VAWA is, it's, so it was set up under that um, act. However, it is not only women who are eligible, men who are victims of domestic abuse also are el eligible. And then there's the special immigrant juvenile um, category, um, which is um, it's uh, children who have been abandoned by their parents. Um, so um, I'm not gonna go into great deal, any detail with those. So I've already touched on this a little bit, but um, family reunification, there's, a lengthy wait, um, depending on um, on what the sponsor's status is. 
and then what, what, what the relative is um, and the type of relationship. Um, so the example I gave earlier is a US citizen who wants to bring his brother from the Philippines will have to wait approximately 19 years. But if you're a lawful permanent resident and you wanna bring your husband and your two-year-old daughter from Mexico, um, because they're immediate family, there, there isn't like, you don't have to wait. Um, there's, uh, there, we, the United States has an interest in reunifying um, immediate family. So um, that process would take as long as it takes to get the initial petition approved and then do the um, consular processing. So um, the refugee status. Um, so refugee status, refugees were defined in 1951 at the UN Refugee Convention. They're defined as someone who is unable or un unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership, a particular social group or political opinion. And if you watched um, the last session, you heard a lot about refugees from my colleague, Natasha. Um, there are currently more than 20 million men, women, and children registered as refugees across the world, mainly living in refugee camps, but there are also many urban refugees. Of these, less than 1% of refugees are resettled each year. Um, and in the United States, if you are resettled as a refugee, you, there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, but one thing um, that happens in terms of immigration is one year after you arrive, you're qualified to adjust your status, which means to, to apply for your green card. Mm -hmm. And once your status is adjusted, your date of re re uh, residency reverts back to your date of arrival to the country. So now um, the, top, the clock ticking for your naturalization goes back to your date of arrival and uh, a refugee has to wait five years from their date of arrival once they've met or once they've um, adjusted status to, um, to naturalize. Um, so I would say um, there are some particular challenges that, so I work at the Center for New North Carolinians now I, and, and we do work with refugees there, but I used to work at the e Elon Humanitarian Immigration Law Clinic which exclusively worked with refugees. Um, and so we saw a lot firsthand, a lot of the challenges um, that refugees um, faced regarding immigration. And so one of the big ones is a lot. So one thing that happened, the refugee process is a really long one. And so you start in the camp and you have your first interview um, and it can take years for you to get through the variety of interviews and your background checks and your health screenings and all of that. It can take years. And in the meantime, your life goes on. And so you started out as a single man interviewing. And now by the time it's time for you to go, you've married and you have a child. But you're generally advised um, by the officers in the camp not to start over the process because obviously that sets you back and it'll start all the way over. So you're advised to just go ahead and go. And then once you get there, you can, there's a special process called refu refugee follow to join. You can petition for your family to come join you and that'll be faster. Um, and once upon a time, it was faster. Um, there was a time uh, where it took about a year and a half. Um, you got to the United States, you petitioned for your family and about a year and a half later, they will join you. Um, a year and a half is already a long time to be separated from, from your, your spouse and child, um, but uh, it's, you know, reasonable-ish. Um, however, um, in the last, the last four years, say, there has been a, uh, a real slowdown in that family reunification process. And so there are families now who have been separated from their spouse and their children for um, five years, um, you know, and just oh. the process isn't moving. Yeah, it's been, it's been um, really difficult. Hopefully that will be changing, um, but there were a lot of barriers. There was um, new, new um, requirements for refugees that applies to people who are coming as refugee follow to join, new um, enhanced uh, screening, like uh, security screenings were um, put into place. Um, refugees were already the most vetted immigrants coming to the United States. And then this new higher level of security 
was um, put in place and, and that affects their families following to join as well. So, um, but so the refugee follow to join uh, process, there's also a two year deadline. I, you run into a problem where people um, don't realize, um, don't know about the process and don't know that they have a two year deadline. So sometimes you can have people who are quickly approaching that two year deadline when they come to you. Um, and then you can petition for your spouse or unmarried children under 21. Um, uh, but it is, like I said, it, it was once about a year and a half process and it's been taking many, many years um, now. And so hopefully that will, that will be rectified soon, but it is a challenge. Another challenge that we dealt with, with a lot. Um, and so imagine refugees have fled persecution, a trauma. A lot of times they've, they've fled war. Um, and so they are often, um, often suffer from PTSD. They've either lived in the wilderness or in a refugee camp with very little health access um, for years at a time. So when they get to the United States, they realize they're often, you know, being diagnosed with heart disease or diabetes or variety of health concerns that really untreated um, can cause some real issues. And so one of the problems that, that we dealt with a lot at Elon was um, challenges for the elderly and impaired. So people who had cognitive issues. And so, as I said earlier, to become a citizen, you need to be able to pass the English test and the civics test. So say you arrive in the United States is at 65 and you've, you're a refugee who's been living in a refugee camp for the last 20 years. And even before that, you were living in like, basically you haven't had healthcare your entire life. Um, and, and so any sort of health issues that you've had have gone untreated. Um, diabetes un, untreated can cause cognitive issues. Trauma causes cognitive issues. All of these things cause trauma, cause cognitive issues um, which makes it really challenging to learn English and civics in order to pass the test. Now there is a medical exception that USCIS offers for these people. And so um, the exception is for anybody with a mental, physical or developmental disability. Um, and it needs to be completed by a doctor. They just recently updated it, increased it, increased the length by about three pages. Um, so it's now rather than six pages, it's nine pages. Um, and the challenge there is that a lot of doctors are very uncomfortable completing immigration paperwork. Um, the second challenge is for those doctors who are willing, there's a very specific way that USCIS wants it filled out. And if it's not filled out in that way, it gets rejected. Um, and so then that person needs to go back to their doctor. If it gets rejected, that person needs to go back to their doctor within a short amount of time and get the doctor to revise it to the specifications of USCIS and USCIS is usually not providing the specifications, but um, so it's, it's a challenge. Um, there are, like I said, there are people who can help them through that process, but if you don't have um, somebody who can help you through that legal process, <clears throat> that is a huge challenge. And one of, the, one of the big barriers is a lot of times because they came here elderly and disabled, they rely on SSI um, to survive. And um, SSI is available to a refugee um, or any legal uh, lawful permanent resident um, for seven years. They can get it up to seven years, but if they haven't naturalized after seven years, they lose it. So if you're relying on SSI to get you by um, and you haven't naturalized within seven years, you lose that and, and now you've lost your means of survival. Um, so it, that's a huge challenge that I think refugees probably face more often than most immigrants. Um, That's here. Are you one yeah. of those people that can help a refugee through the process? Yes, yeah. So um, be because at Elon, I did a lot of that. Um, I actually am, am it's a, something that's, because it's so challenging, CNNC did it for a while and then they stopped because it was just a lot, a lot of work. But mm -hmm. I'm sort of reviving that um, because I have a lot of experience with that. And, um, so yeah, we are a place where, where clients can come to get assistance um, with that particular um, application or um, form. So, uh, And is that part of the 
the DOJ uh, accreditation that you have? Um, so the DOJ accreditation is basically um, the uh, Department of Justice started this program, I actually don't know when, um, in order to expand access to um, immigration legal services to low income um, uh, immigrants. And so the DOJ accreditation program is first, um, so it's, it's always housed in a nonprofit um, and they need to provide low cost um, immigration services. And so first the organization gets, um, gets recognition through the Department of Justice and then individuals at that organization apply for DOJ accreditation. In order to get um, DOJ accreditation, you have to um, have trained and, um, and practiced in some way immigration law um, and be able to, like you basically submit an application showing um, all of the training and experience that you've had. And so for me, I was lucky in that I was trained under two immigration attorneys at um, Elon. Um, so I had a really, really great experience. Um, and so, but um, as an individual accredited rep, your accreditation is um, tied to the organization you work at. So if you change organizations, then you have to reapply for accreditation. And there's partial accreditation, um, which means you can do any sort of uh, work with USCIS um, or there's full accreditation. So if you're going to work um, with uh, immigrants and deportation proceedings or something like that, and you're going to be in a courtroom, you have to be fully accredited which means you have to show in your application that you have courtroom experience, you know how to you know, do all of that. Our office is only, we have two partially accredited reps because, um, because uh, we do not um, do anything with deportation proceedings. We don't do anything in immigration courts. We are strictly doing USCIS work. So we're doing strictly applications and petitions um, for immigration benefits. Um, Thank you for that question. Yeah, thank um, you. So asylum is very similar to refugees. The main difference with asylum is that um, you must make the claim in the US or at a US border. Um, and so you can, there's a one year filing deadline. So say you come to the United States as a student and um, you're here as a student, but you fear returning to your home country you have to apply for asylum within one year of your arrival. Um, if you don't meet that deadline, you have to have a very good reason why not. Like there has to be some sort of change circumstance um, for you to do that. When you're presenting yourself at the border, you have a right to a credible fear interview, um, which, so the credible fear interview is like just basically a, a low bar to make sure that yes, you are actually, um, fleeing from persecution. Yes, we do believe there's something you're, you're fearful of that you're running away from. Um, and then you're, um, so there are two different um, asylum processes and I'm getting way too into too, too much detail I know. Um, uh, there's affirmative asylum. That's if you're like a student who comes here and you apply within a year. And then there's defensive asylum and defensive asylum is usually if you're being deported or in the case of being at the border, it's um, expedited removal. Um, and at the border, the, um, the situation is interesting because like if you're doing affirmative asylum, you're going through USCIS. If you're being deported and doing defensive asylum, you're going through the immigration courts. Um, but if you're at the border, it's a combination. So the credible fear interview will be done by a USCIS officer, but then you're put through the immigration courts. Um, and a lot of what you heard um, over the last four years about caravans of people coming to the border from Central America, um, the Northern Triangle, a lot of those people were coming to claim asylum as they have an international and, and um, uh, federal right to do under um, US immigration law. Um, and there were a lot of, we won't get into that, but there were a lot of policies um, that basically in over the last four years that tried to more or less stop the asylum process. Um, um, but it, I mean, they were all being challenged in the courts um, and probably in the end would not have um, stood, stood their ground because they just are not in, in alignment with our laws, but um, they, they did a lot of damage. 
So we talked about all of those who have a pathway to the um, to citizenship, and then those. Now we're going to talk a bit about those with no pathway to citizenship. Um, so I think Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA, or you've probably heard them called Dreamers. They have certainly it's a it's um, a group of people that have had a lot of um, attention in the media over. Gosh. I mean, probably since 2012 when, when um, DACA was established. Um, so basically um, DACA is a form of protection where, so the idea behind DACA is that um, these kids came to the United States by no volition of their own. Their parents brought them here when they were young um, and they have grown up here and known really no other life. Um, and so they are in all, senses of the word American, except for officially um, as citizens. And, and so the idea is with the deferred action is let's not punish them for an action their parents took. And now they, here they are in the situation with this limbo situation where, you know, they can't get a job. They, you know, they have all these limitations on what they can do. And the first um, legislative proposal to try to deal with this population of people was a bipartisan proposal that was proposed in 2001. Mm -hmm. um, and there were new proposals proposed like every few years um, and they were it just never passed. And basically, I mean, if you follow the news at all, you know that immigration is, is a very, very difficult um, area to find agreement on, um, not only across parties, but within parties. Um, and, and so DACA, I think has been a victim of that because I think I think while there is bipartisan support for a DACA, like, you know, basically giving this group of people a pathway to citizenship, it always is tied up with other issues that there isn't that bipartisan support for. So um, finally, in, in 2012, Obama um, established DACA through an executive order. Um, and the eligibility requirements for DACA are that you were under 31 years of age on June 15, 2012, which is right around the executive order, um, that you came to the US before you turned 16, mm -hmm. that you've been in the US since 2007. And that means that you have to be able to show that you were physically here from 2007 on, which usually means like collecting school records and things like that. Um, and that you are either in school, have a GED, GED a high school degree, or you've served in the military. Um, if you, once you get DACA, you can work. So you get employment authorization. However, there is no pathway to citizenship. And as we saw over the last four years, because this was established through an executive order, it is very tentative. Um, it is, it is, it can be pulled away. Um, I mean, Trump tried to, the uh, Supreme Court rejected that. Um, so I guess that gives it a little bit more strength um, that the Supreme Court has has um, disallowed just terminating the program as as was attempted in the previous administration. Um, there are currently 645,000 dreamers. Um, and I, I think that if any immigration bills get passed in the next four years, the dreamers will definitely be addressed. But um, while they have employment authorization, it is it is a tentative situation and um, one in which you can't really count on. Um, I mean, basically, anytime you don't have a pathway to citizenship, you're in a tentative situation. All it takes is a change in in mood in the country to make you feel at risk. Mm -hmm. um, so, a similar group um, are um, temporary protected status people with temporary protected status. Um, and so temporary protected status um, can be designated by the Secretary of Homeland Security due to ongoing armed conflicts such as civil war or an environmental disaster like an earthquake or a hurricane or an epidemic or other extraordinary and temporary, and, and temporary conditions. Um, so if you are in the United States when, some, when um, this event happens and temporary protected status is put in place, um, then you are allowed to apply for employment authorization because basically they've decided your home either is not safe for you to return to or it would be an undue burden to your country to try to absorb you because there's not the work and, and things like that 
Um, so we're going to let you stay here um, for the time being. And so you're allowed then to get employment authorization, travel documents so that you can travel in and out of the US um, uh, and you cannot be removed from the US. Um, just recently, Venezuela was added um, to the temporary protected status list. Um, oh. Yeah, um, that is something that had been being lobbied for for quite some time. Um, and it was just granted um, or just announced um, maybe two weeks ago. Um, currently, there are more than 400,000 um, TPS holders in the US. Um, and then we have just your general. So those are, those are people who are lucky enough to be in a category in which they are able to get an uh, employment authorization. Um, and with employment authorization comes um, a social security card as well. Um, that does not mean that they will be eligible for social security. That means that they are eligible to pay into social security. Um, undocumented immigrants um, are, the currently they're estimated to be about 1 million undocumented, undocumented people in the US. Um, while we are led to believe that the undocumented immigrants are all pouring over the border and that's how they get here, actually almost half of undocumented immigrants actually entered the US on a valid visa and then just overstayed the visa. So if you come here on a visitor's visa, generally the, the visa time period is six months. If you come and you just stay beyond that, now you've overstayed and now you're an undocumented immigrant. Um, uh, the same thing if you're a student visa, you finish school, but you stay, now you're an un undocumented immigrant. Um, uh, in 2017, about two thirds of um, unauthorized immigrant adults had been in the US more than 10 years, which means that they had established lives here. Um, they maybe had homes, businesses, children um, in the United States. Um, so they're not transient. They are a part of their communities at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so just to give a sense of what undocumented immigrants, the kind of challenges they face just living in the world. Um, undocumented immigrants cannot get a driver's license in most states, including North Carolina. Um, they can't get a state ID. Um, they can't get a social security number. Um, they can't get employment authorization, which that puts them at risk. So they end up working for employers who are hiring undocumented people. And because they know that they have undocumented people, they don't have to follow OSHA laws. They don't have to follow all of the various rules that you have to follow um, with your employers, employees, because you know your employees, employees don't have the power to report you um, because they put themselves at risk to do that. Um, so they put them themselves, they're at risk of abuse um, by employers because they don't have employment authorization. Um, they do not have access to federal public benefits like social security, Medicaid, Medicare, and food stamps. Um, undocumented immigrants can enroll in public schools and apply to college, although they're not eligible for federal financial aid. They can file their taxes through individual tax ID numbers um, instead of social security numbers. And many, many, many do because they have hope that at some point they will have a pathway to the lawful permanent residency, like through marriage or, you know, some, some pathway or you know, something, some pathway that'll open up to them and to have been a, a, um, an immigrant who paid their taxes all, you know, going back. Um, there's a lot of pride in that, I think. And, um, and there's, it is, a, I think it's a symbol of hope. Like, yes, I'm paying my taxes. Um, and because I believe in the future, there'll be a pathway here for me. Um, and what, what happens when, once you actually um, get lawful permanent resident status and you get a social security number, if you have an ITIN, you can go back and, um, and uh, get like connect those. And then you have your entire social security history um, with your um, social security card. So um, I have done a really good job of moving quickly. <laughs> 
we had we actually already have a question. Um, somebody okay. wanted to clarify. Um, so is it uh one million undocumented people or eleven million? Eleven million. Okay. I'm sorry. Did I say one million? It's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, it's eleven. Uh, estimated to be about eleven million undocumented people in the United States. Um, historically, the majority of those had been Mexican. Um, although since the um the uh, crisis in 2008, that number has gone down. And one of the reasons that that number has gone down is we've actually established work programs with Mexico so that like a lot of people in Mexico were driven to come to the United States for work. Mm -hmm. So there are like push factors and pull factors. Um, and uh, pull factors are the employment opportunities in the United States and the money that can be made. And so Mexico, it had like, you know, a lot of that pull factor impacted a lot of the people coming here. But there are work programs now that we have for temporary work programs specifically for Mexican workers that allows them to come here for a period of time and then go back home, which a lot of them, that's really what they prefer. They want to go back. They want to be able to come here and work and go back home. Um, and so that has actually decreased the number of undocumented immigrants from Mexico by quite a lot. Now, the number from the Northern Triangle countries of Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras has increased. Mm -hmm. And that's because not only do you have that pull factor of, of money, but you have the push factor of um, there's a lot of gang violence in those countries. The government is completely ineffective in protecting its citizens. Um, Honduras was hit by two hurricanes this past fall. Um, like there's a lot, so there's, there's, you know, um, there's like mother nature sort of disasters and then there's violence and crime um, and a government that, that doesn't do anything really to protect its people. So you have a lot of, a lot of people coming from that area as economic migrants, but also a lot who are, you know, coming to claim asylum. We have we have several more questions now. Um, the, so uh, the first um, is from uh, Andrew Young saying, can you say something about our local scene and how courts are treating newcomers? For example, a lot of power is in the hands of a county DA to pursue or not pursue certain charges that can threaten deportation. Um, how are Guilford County's DAs responding? Hmm. That is a good question, a very good question, one that I'm not really qualified to answer since I don't do a lot, um, like I don't do anything with deportation, so that's an area that I don't have any experience in. Um, I, I know that, I, I don't know under the new DA, um, and she's not all that new anymore, I suppose, it's I, maybe 2018. Um, um, I know that the DA's office before that was very good about um, about working with uh, immigration attorneys to make sure that like if a client um, had some sort of criminal charge that because a lot of times DAs you know it's all about pleading out and you know that plea can be great for a citizen but for an immigrant it it it's devastating to their immigration to their ability to to naturalize or if they mm -hmm. haven't yet to to get lawful permanent residency. Um, and I know that the previous DA's office was really good about that. I am not as familiar with, with the new DA and, um, and how her office is. We have a logistics question, um, mm -hmm. which is the immigration office and immigration judge used to be in Charlotte, but they were closed several years ago. Where is the nearest immigration office and immigration court now? Okay, so there is, so for USCIS, so that's if you're doing, if you're trying to naturalize or you're applying for your green card, you'll need to go for an interview. Um, and there are two different USCIS offices. There's one in Raleigh and there's one in Charlotte. And then immigration court, there is, there is an immigration court in Charlotte. And so cases, um, so say an asylum case that is filed here. Um, a defensive asylum case that is filed here in Greensboro would be heard in Charlotte um, at the immigration court there. Um, a, a quick reminder to our participants, um, you can put your question into the chat or you can use the QA. Um, there is a little icon that says Q&A underneath and you can use that. Um, 
We will not be answering raised hands, so please put it into the chat or into the Q&A. Um, we do have another question, uh, which was from uh, Joan Hudson asking, why is it called temporary protective status? However, they can't be removed from the US. Please clarify. So they can't be removed from the US as long as they have temporary protected status. Um, so as long as that country is under temporary protected status and temporary protected status, I mean, it, it can, in some cases, it's like with Haiti, I believe it has had temporary protected status for like 20 years. Um, so people who were here 20 years ago and I think Haiti would, that have been an earthquake 20 years ago, probably a devastating yes. earthquake. Yeah. Um, they have like, they go back and they reassess these countries regularly. Like, so um, temporary protected status is generally set for like two years, a, mm -hmm. a year and a half, two years, something like that. Um, and then they go back and reassess the country to see if conditions have changed and if it's okay for them to, to lift temporary protected status. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are countries that they've deemed like, you know, Haiti, they've decided, no, I mean, the conditions haven't changed. It isn't any better. We're not going to list, lift temporary protected status. But when they do that for a country, that um, the people who have temporary protected status lose that status. And so then when their employment authorization runs out, they're no longer authorized to work in the United States and um, they're no longer authorized to be here really. Um, so, it is it it isn't like they can be removed from the United States once they no longer have temporary protected status. Um, so we also have another question. Um, some misdemeanors can trigger ICE. Is that correct? Um, so misdemeanors. Well, well, I mean, I think that that probably depends on where you live. Um, uh, I mean, it depends if you if you're picked up for a misdemeanor. Um, and you're in Alamance County, that could potentially be bad. Um, it just depends. It really, I think it depends on the relationship of your local police department with ICE. But, um, but in terms of triggering ICE, I don't actually, once again, because we don't do deportation, I don't have a lot of experience in that area. I will say that there are misdemeanors that can um, exclude you from eligibility for naturalizing. So say you have a misdemeanor involving marijuana, but it's like a, like say you have two misdemeanors mm -hmm. for marijuana, for possession of marijuana of under an ounce. That's, that's a misdemeanor in, in North Carolina and, and, you know, involves a fine, but for immigration purposes, you now are, don't pass the good moral character test. Um, uh, if you have two of those charges. Um, so but I can't speak so much to the ICE question, again, because we don't do deportation and generally aren't, aren't dealing with ICE um, and, and, thing, and people who, who are dealing with ICE, so. Um, the next question is um, a, a great one. Can undocumented persons serve in the US armed services? That is a great question. I believe they can. And I believe it is potentially a pathway, like I believe serving is a pathway to, I may be totally wrong on that. Like um, I will say that undocumented immigrants isn't really like my wheelhouse. <laughs> we're, we're basically, we're usually dealing with people once they have a, a pathway. So even if they had been undocumented, but now like their child is petitioning for them or something like that. Um, that's usually the point at which our office is dealing with them. But um, I want to say, just from general knowledge, um, that that military can be a pathway because you certainly hear stories of of people being deported <laughs> um, who who served in the military. Um, we have a delicate question here. Um, they, uh, somebody asked, um, North Carolina and Greensboro has a long relationship with Mountain Yards. This is for anybody in the chat who is not familiar with Greensboro. This is true. We have a huge relationship with the Mountain Yard population. Um, and they often have come here for um, essentially safety from the homes that they had um, during the Vietnam War and what occurred there. 
Um, so this person continues on saying that we saw the first deportations of some of our mountain yards during the Trump administration. Um, is there any chance of them um, trying to come back during the new administration? Like the people who have been deported? I believe that is the question. I, I doubt, I doubt that the Biden administration is going to do anything to undo deportations that are, have already happened. I do think that they'll probably return to the policy that the Obama administration had, which is like focus on deportation of criminals and um, and actually the the Montagnard people who were deported um, were basically people who who had probably came here as refugees <clears throat> and and committed crimes and either. Um, were deported before they became lawful permanent residents because sometimes people come as refugees and then they they even though they're eligible at one year they don't um, don't apply for lawful permanent resident status for a long time or um, or when they applied to naturalize um, but usually once you're grant once you're granted lawful permanent resident status um, it's probably they were not lawful permanent residents yet but came as refugees and and had committed crimes that were deportable offenses. Um, I don't think that the Biden administration will undo um, deportations, but I don't think that that policy will continue either. Um, um, on the temporary protective status question, there is also a question of, um, and this hasn't, I think this hasn't happened for quite some time, but it's a kind of interesting conundrum. Um, what happens if a person's country no longer exists? Well, so Sudan is like one situation where Sudan is um, temporary, has temporary protected status. Um, but when South, when they split into Sudan and South Sudan, um, South Sudan also, I believe, has temporary protected status too. So basically they made, it, it was previously just Sudan and now it's two countries that have temporary protected status. So that's what they did in that case. I'm sure it varies from place to place, but um, I would imagine probably if the conditions continue um, in the new place, whatever it is now called, um, then that, that place would um, be granted temporary protected status as well. That is interesting. And uh, we do have a final uh, question, or at least I think it'll probably be a final question, which is, um, can you tell us more about the current issues at the border with the unaccompanied minors? What is happening? So, um, so the border is, according to um, oh, it's uh, Title Forty Two, which is I believe a CDC rule. Um, the the Trump administration actually closed the border um, because of COVID, and they they closed it last March. Um, and so basically, anybody coming to the border is just expelled, um, and that was happening from March all the way on. And then in November, so the United States actually has a ruling there, or there's a, a, an act called the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act um, that was uh, passed. I don't know. It's, I don't actually know when it was passed, but um, it has been in effect and it, it protects minors um, from being trafficked. And so in November of last year, a federal judge said, you can't expel minors, unaccompanied minors who are coming to the border, um, like you've been expelling everybody because of like using Title 42 to expel everybody because of COVID, you can't expel them. Okay. Because we have a duty through this law to protect them from being trafficked. And if we expel them, they are at risk of being trafficked. So we need to take them in and then there's another law, the Flores law, which says that you can't hold um, minors um, for more than 72 hours, which is what led to that, that law um, is what led the Trump administration to the family, family separation policy that it had. It's like, oh, we can't hold children, but we can hold their parents. So we'll just separate the children and the parents. Um, and that of course did not go over well in public opinion. And it was, 
it was stopped. But um, now what they're doing, they're so the, the crisis at the border is because so in November, the federal a federal judge said you can't expel unaccompanied minors, and so at, over time, more and more unaccompanied minors have been coming. And this is again from those Northern Triangle countries: Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, who are these these children at home are at threat of ga gang violence. Mm -hmm. They are often threatened, like if you don't join our gang, we'll kill you. We'll kill your family. And so imagine what a family, what a, what a parent is thinking, what, what the situation must be for a parent to think, I'm going to send my 10 year old unaccompanied to the border of the United States. And often these people have, have family members in the United States. So they're not sending them blindly. They're just hoping to get them into the United States and then get them with their family in the United States. But that is how bad the situation is, is that they're willing to send their children on a long journey to the border of the United States. And so, so many children are there that the, the um, so it's the Office of Refugee Resettlement actually that, that handles mm -hmm. um, unaccompanied minors. And that office is overwhelmed by the number of people. And also there were a number of facilities that were meant to, to hold these um, children that were shut down over previous years. And so there's just not enough space and they're overburdened and children are now spending longer than the 72 hours. And so it's basically a matter of finding space to shift them out. They can't be, um, they need to get to ORR custody within okay. 72 hours. They can't be at, with C, um, the Customs and Border Patrol for mm -hmm. longer than 72 hours because they don't have the ability to take care of kids. Um, they need to get them to ORR custody. And so right now the challenge is getting that flow happening. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just so many kids coming. But so the border is closed right now, except to unaccompanied minors. And that is because um, the Title 42, which is used to close the border, the, a federal judge said you can't use that with unaccompanied minors. So, yeah. So it is, where is it was before coronavirus, essentially there were families that were coming. Mm -hmm. It's now just children that yeah, are- well, I think that there are still families coming um, because if, if you, because they're not gonna do family separation, right? So if you do have families coming, I, I think the, the, the higher number and the bigger problem are the unaccompanied minors, but there mm -hmm. are families coming to the border, just not in as high in numbers as unaccompanied minors. Um, because if, if children come, they're not going to expel them. And so, so likewise not, and they're not going to separate families. So uh -huh. families are able to come, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's essentially the United States immigration system is broken. Um, and, and it needs to be fixed, but there's just not the political will, um, and not, not the agreement, mm -hmm. um, among not even just across party lines, but uh, within parties on what should what should happen. Um, and the Biden administration has put forward an immigration bill that they hope to pass in the next four years, but it's, you know, it, it's- Four years, that's- Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, I haven't heard it being, um, being the next big policy goal. So I think, I think, um, the infrastructure is the next goal. So that means immigration will be pushed off and pushed off probably, so. Um, well, Betsy, we are now out of time. I am so sorry to say, um, thank you so much for answering all of the questions and for your wonderful presentation. And thank you to everybody who has joined us for today's webinar, Immigrant and Refugee Legal Issues. Um, of course, a big special thank you to the Center for New North Carolinians um, and for all of the um, presentations they have done through the month of March for us, uh, highlighting the issues that immigrants and refugees are going through in our very county um, and in our state, of course, around us. Um, I want to make sure to note for any community members who might need um, to know that the Center for New North Carolinians is proud to be a recipient of the USCIS Citizen and Integration Act grant, allowing them to provide legal assistance 
free legal assistance for naturalization applications. So if you or someone you know is ready to naturalize, please contact Betsy and her office and they would be happy to assist you in that process or assist your friend in that process. Um, also, a thank you to all of our wonderful participants tonight. Um, you all and your support really make this possible and we are always so pleased to have you. Um, again, as we were talking about earlier, Betsy gave us such a great prompt for this um, earlier, but tune in on Tuesday, April 6th at 6 p.m. for our next set of webinars, which is from grassroots to government. And the first session is immigrant support and why it is needed. So you are going to continue with the topic of immigration. And this is gonna be a little bit more about how to petition the government to uh, potentially help with situations that are ongoing, um, which kind of flows perfectly from what Ms. Jensen so wonderfully outlined for us. Um, so attendance is free to all of the education webinars at the Greensboro History Museum, but do not forget to register. So go to www.greensborohistory.org or Greensboro History, History Museum's Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter platforms to learn more about these presentations and others that will be coming up in the future. Um, we thank you all very much for being here with us, and I wish everybody a very good night.